Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I welcome you to our 10th Patari session, which stands for Papers, Thoughts and Research Insights. Today's Patari is going to be on survival analysis. Uh, this is going to be the first in a series of two uh, Pataris on survival analysis. The first part is on survival analysis using statistical algorithms, uh, uh, statistical tools, and the other one is going to be more focused, or the next one is going to be more focused on uh, machine learning. I would uh, begin by thanking all the volunteers who have done a magnificent job in putting this together. Uh, they are listed on your screen in order uh, of appearance in this uh, presentation. So we're going to go ahead and start the presentation now. Uh, the inspiration for this Patari actually came, in, at least in my head, on a statement that David made in one of our uh, regular team meetings, and that is death is not, in, not a subjective assessment. So in, especially in, in our uh, field of research, uh, the event of either uh, someone sadly passing away from cancer can be used uh, to learn about different mechanisms through which cancer spreads or how this disease manifests itself in the human body. And that becomes very valuable data. So that's how we actually do that is through survival analysis. And that is what the goal of this Patari is. Today we are going to talk about, as I said earlier, the core uh, fundamentals of survival analysis using statistical methods. So let's push ahead. Uh, the organization of the Patari is as follows. I'll be starting off uh, with the introduction. A bit of intuition on how survival analysis can be used within our field as well as in other areas. Uh, before moving on to some fundamentals on probability and hypothesis testing, which will be covered by David and Adam, because those are crucial for understanding the rest of the, some, some of those concepts are going to be crucial for understanding the rest of the Patari. Uh, formulation and definition of key terms for survival analysis is going to be covered by Noor, so this is going to be a bit more formal. Uh, KM curves uh, would be covered by Rob, as well as uh, comparing groups, how can we compare the survival of different groups and uh, the Cox proportional hazard model. All of those will be covered by Rob. We'll talk about performance assessment, biases and caveats. Uh, th that will be covered by Adam. What you should be careful for, uh, how do you assess the performance of a survival analysis model? Then we talk about power analysis or how many samples do you need for an effective uh, survival analysis uh, to, to do effective survival analysis. That is going to be covered by Adam. And of course, we kept the best for the last. We will have some Python coding exercises as well as uh, a notebook uh, that Venchi is going to talk about. There's also going to be a quiz at the end and Adam is going to coordinate that. So let's push ahead. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, you can, we can, we'll be able to take short questions during the presentation if something is not clear. Uh, all the presenters know, know that, so you can stop the proceeding by raising your hand or uh, just uh, stating your question uh, in uh, through your microphone. Uh, that way it would become recorded uh, as part of this video and might be helpful uh, for audience later on as well. So please go ahead with your questions if you see one, if you, ha if you have one. So we'll begin the story with uh, the movie Gladiator, which I believe most of you have, uh, uh, that, that you most, most of you would have watched. So the movie begins with uh, Marcus Aurelius in the battlefield, and Marcus Aurelius died suspiciously in his military quarters in that movie. There is another uh, Roman emperor in that movie, Commodus, Marcus Aurelius's son, who is also killed. So in, 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 in the year 193 AD, there were actually five emperors that were killed uh, soon after taking charge or at the very beginning of their reign. So it is. Uh, it was a very dangerous profession to be a Roman emperor. Your odds of dying as a Roman emperor through violent means were pretty high. There's actually a really nice paper that I welcome you to read. It covers uh, not only the, the history, but also provides a very good statistical analysis on uh, what are your odds of surviving as a Roman emperor. But my question to you is, uh, what percentage of Roman emperors do you think died non-violent deaths? And how many of them experienced a violent death by murder or by suicide or something like that? And any, any, any volunteers who want to take this question? Zero percent? 
Nasser says zero percent. It's it's slightly higher than that. There were there were some some uh, emperors that actually died of natural causes. So this is uh, these are the actual statistics in just in terms of raw probability values. Uh, uh, so the probability of natural death or the chances of natural death for a Roman emperor were thirty eight percent. Most of them actually died a violent death, either through assassination, in battle with a foreign enemy, or suicide. So the chances weren't that great that if you want to become a Roman emperor, be prepared. That's the essential lesson here. But the question we are interested in and how it relates to survival analysis is if you are given data like this, like you have a data for uh, an emperor, when they started their reign and when they ended their reign, and whether they experience what we will be calling an event, which in this case is violent death, which is defined by either assassination, battle with the enemy or suicide. So if whether they experience that event or not, and we have data for all of the Roman emperors over here, and we can also represent this data in the form of this timeline that you see on the right hand side. So we know when uh, emperor took charge, when they were ousted uh, by any means, and whether they experience a uh, violent death or not. If you are given data like this, we know we can calculate these probability values of uh, what percentage of people or these Roman emperors died a violent death. However, the question that we are interested in is what is the probability of survival that is not dying a violent death if you are within X years of your range of your reign? So if you have been an emperor for about two years, what are the chances of you, you surviving? OK, so let's say if you've got data like this one uh, in a very abstract plot that you see on your screen on the X axis is time unlabeled. And on the Y axis, each line represents the reign of a Roman emperor. So they start this their reign over here and then they continue. And a uh, lightning bolt presents uh, that they were violently killed at this time. So what is the probability? We can calculate the probability of someone dying a violent death very easily. So out of on the on the screen, you have three individuals, one of which experiences an event that is a violent death at this time. So the probability of dying a violent death at this particular time is one out of three. There were three people which were at risk of dying a violent death and one of them did die. So the probability of this is one by three. Assuming that all of them had made it this far at, at this time step. So this is what is called a hazard as Noor is going to formally introduce it. But our goal is to calculate the survival probability. What is the probability of surviving? So at this time step, for example, all three of these emperors survived. So the odds of survival at this time step would probably be 100%, but they would decrease as we move along this x-axis. And uh, that's what we really want to calculate. Given data like this, like this table that you see, we, we have uh, the duration of their reign, as well as whether they experience that particular event that we are interested in, in this case, a violent death. Our goal is essentially in survival analysis or the whole of the Patari session today is how do we convert this table into a survival function? And this is a sort of survival function that we are aiming towards. On the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is the probability of survival or your chances of survival at any given time. So at two years, what are the chances that uh, a particular Roman emperor would be alive or what are the, what are the chances at, at 10 years? So this is the plot from the paper that I just talked about that analyzes data of all the survey of all the Roman emperors. And as you can see, the probability of course goes down uh, as we uh, as we go through the age again, just to emphasize this is the probability of dying a violent death. Of course, all of us are going to die, so this is always going to go down, but this is uh, a very specific definition of dying from a violent cause by murder or through suicide, okay, or by, at the hands of a foreign enemy. So at, as in this plot, you can see that about 50% of the Roman emperors uh, were actually, they didn't make it until the eighth year of their reign. And uh, then there was a period of relative calm, and then uh, the survival curve takes it another dip. So we can analyze these survival functions. This is what we are going to talk about, how to construct these functions, uh, this plot from this data. That's the first thing. And how can we analyze it, uh, analyze these survival functions to get an idea of what the hazard is like of dying a, a violent death if you made it to a certain year. So that's the next question. Can you guess what is the hazard of dying a violent death? If you are an emperor at X years of your range of, of your reign. So, for example, if you are an emperor at four years, 
what are what is your hazard of dying at that particular time if you've made it this far? So that is what is represented in the form of a hazard function. And this is the hazard function without going into details of how it's made. Uh, uh, on the y axis is the hazard of dying at any given time on the y x axis is time. And what we see is that there are a lot of Roman emperors that died very early on uh, in their reign. At, so they died a violent death very early on, actually within the first year of their reign. So this is uh, uh, similar to infant mortality in population studies. So uh, although it's applied on a very different problem over here of uh, Roman emperors dying, uh, so they weren't infants, but they were their reign was in its infancy. So they were killed very early on. And if you made it through that phase up to the first two years, then uh, as a Roman emperor, you had pretty good chances of surviving. The hazard of dying from two years to 10 years was pretty low. And just when you were feeling relaxed, watching a movie as a Roman emperor at 10 years of your reign, things would start to heat up again. There would be conspiracies in which you can be killed or you can have a battle with a foreign enemy. So this is reminiscent of uh, wear out mortality in machines. So that's, uh, you can see another rise in the hazard over here. So it's important to understand the concept of survival functions, like the plots like this one and how they relate to these hazard functions. Both of them are very informative. So, and deliberately, I did not pick an example for cancer because those are, uh, that's essentially what we do all the time. And there are some examples on cancer, but having a broader understanding is going to help cement this, uh, these concepts of survival function and the hazard function itself. Okay, so that's that. We can also analyze uh, use reliability analysis or survival analysis as it is called in manufacturing to uh, analyze the survival of light bulbs. So think of yourself as a light bulb now instead of a Roman emperor. And uh, let's say if you have a light bulb for form and we analyze how when a uh, light bulb fails after how many after after time after how much time. So let's say if, if there is an incandescent bulb and it survives for uh, 1427 units of time and we haven't noticed that this fails. So this is what we are going to say that this has been censored because we didn't observe the event of it failing. On the other hand, if you have an incandescent light bulb, which makes it to uh, about 2000 units of time, and we saw that it failed at this particular time, then we say that this event was observed or not censored in this case. Based on this data, we can not only analyze uh, the overall group level survival, but we can also analyze the survival of each of these subgroups of incandescent or fluorescent light bulbs. And as you can see, uh, this, these are the survival curves for these two different light bulbs, and you know which one you would pick the next time you go to the supermarket. So these fluorescent ones are actually, they have a higher survival chances or survival probabilities in comparison to these uh, incandescent ones. So that's how it can be used. There's also a lot of work on churn prediction, that is uh, customer loyalty analysis, how long is, uh, uh, what are the chances of, of a customer churning at any given time, that's also used. Uh, that's also very related to survival, but what most of this, the stuff that we do is actually related to disease. So we're gonna start with a very simple disease, which is called being human. On the x-axis over here uh, is age, and on the y-axis is the share of individuals surviving to a given age. And this is done for different, in different, uh, at different periods in the history of uh, mankind. And this is uh, the chances of an individual surviving up to a certain age. And as you can see, we have an increase in the overall survival uh, of uh, the human population. Okay, so this is the hazard curve of uh, being human. Uh, the hazard is pretty low when you are in your team or uh, that I find really strange because that's when you do most of the fun stuff. Anyways, the hazard increases over time uh, as you age and this, there is a there is an exponential increase uh, over time. Uh, in the beginning, there's also a period of infancy. So these, these two curves are related to each other. This is the survival curve. This is the hazard function in this case. Okay. We can also analyze uh, the effect of uh, treated and untreated patients to analyze the impact of different type of drugs, for example. Now we can, just like two different light bulbs, we have these two different groups of patients and our goal is to analyze their survival probability to see whether there is a significant difference between these two groups. If there is, then uh, at least we can say that the drug has a, an effect. If it increases the overall survival, then we say it has a positive impact, otherwise no. 
Okay, so we can use it for this purpose. We can also do it, uh, use it for subtyping different types of cancers. So this is, uh, the, these are the survival curves of three different types of mesotheliomas. On the x-axis again is time, on the y-axis is the survival probability for these three different types of mesotheliomas. And as you can see, if you uh, at uh, if you take the take the sarcomatoid type of mesothelioma, 50% of those patients actually die within the first four months of being diagnosed. So it's a very aggressive form uh, or a very deadly form of cancer. If if the or if if the person suffers from an epithelioid type of mesothelioma, then their uh, 50 or the median survival time is about eight months. So this median survival time is a good uh, first analysis thing that you can do or to get an idea of the overall survival. So if you have a population, you can divide into different groups and you can subtype different types of cancer based on their survival as well. You can also do it for the, we, there are, there's a lot of work on survival analysis during the COVID pandemic. And on the, on the first plot over here on the left hand side, you can see what is the impact of age on survival. So the chances of survival actually increase with age. As you can see this blue curve over here, which was people with less than 65 years of age of surviving in the hospital at X number of days after being admitted. Uh, and, and these two other subgroups are uh, are for people with higher age groups. So as you, this, you can clearly see that uh, as you increase age, your chances of survival go down. So uh, age is a hazard in terms of uh, surviving with COVID. OK, uh, over here, and that's how the people found out this uh, this thing. And on in this uh, plot over here shows the effect of hydro, uh, hydro hydroxychloroquine between two different groups uh, who were given. One of them was given this drug. The other one did was not given this drug. And as you can see, the survival curve is no different, or at least as we shall see, not statistically significantly different. Hence, hydroxychloroquine uh, does not have an effect on improving the chances of survival. On the other hand, remdesivir has a minor effect in, in improving survival. So as you can see, people with who were given remdesivir did receive, did get a, an improvement in their survival uh, times. So the, the curve at the top over here. Uh, on the right hand side is another analysis during the COVID pandemic of people uh, being hospitalized with COVID-19 symptoms, and then they were given uh, anticoagulant or not. So these are the two groups. And as you can see, giving an anticoagulant to patients who were hospitalized improved their odds of survival. And that's how we could reach the conclusion that we should be giving people anticoagulants if they're admitted to the hospital. So this is the sort of thing you can use it for. Uh, but before moving on and how we actually go from that sort of a table to these uh, KM curves, as you can see, there are uh, in order to assess statistical significance, we need to understand the concept of statistical, sig st st statistical significance and hypothesis testing, as that would become crucial in uh, studying these uh, survival curves. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, Nasser has posted a comment about uh, the effect of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, yeah, that's how we separate myth from uh, facts by actually analyzing the survival curves of patients with and without uh, a drug in clinical trials. So thank you for that comment. Uh, I'll hand over to David and Adam who are going to talk about uh, how to do hypo uh, hypothesis testing and statistical significance testing before we actually move on into these and how these will be used in survival analysis. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Bias. Can everyone hear me OK? Yes. OK, before I pass on to David, I'm just going to very quickly talk about hypothesis testing. So hypothesis testing is a method of making statistical decisions about the population on the basis of experimental data. So the idea behind hypothesis tests in a lot of scenarios basically is to determine whether there is there is a statistically significant difference in the two groups in the comparison. So one of the most simple um, hypothesis tests we can do is a t-test. And the aim of that is to see if we can find a statistically significant difference in the means of the two groups in the comparison. In the case of survival analysis, we often use a log rank test, which uh, Rob's going to talk about more in detail in a bit. And uh, the null hypothesis of a um, log rank test is that the survival experience is the same across the two or more groups compared. So in hypothesis testing, we basically use this idea, it's a bit like the court system, that something's um, innocent until they're proven guilty. 
So we put out this null hypothesis, and that's sort of the devil's advocate statement. And then we say, actually, is this alternative hypothesis true instead? Can we prove the null hypothesis wrong and say, maybe the alternative hypothesis is, is, correct, is correct instead? So as, as I was saying, sorry, a survival analysis, the null hypothesis is that the survival experience um, is the same across two or more groups being compared. Whereas the alternative hypothesis might be that the survival experience is different. So if you've got a control arm and say an intervention arm, you might, you might hope to find that the survival experience in the intervention arm is better than in the control arm. Um, and once you've done a hypothesis test or an inferential test, you get a test statistic and you get a corresponding p-value with this test statistic. Um, so the p-value tells you how likely your data could have occurred under the null hypothesis. Um, and we typically take cutoff values for this p-value, most commonly called alpha. It's called, a, um, sorry, most commonly called a significance level and we call it alpha. And the most common value we take is 0.05. And if we get a p-value less than or equal to 0.05, we often say we have evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Um, I'm going to specifically say there here that a p-value below 0.05 gives you evidence to reject the null hypothesis. It doesn't necessarily tell you that the alternative hypothesis was correct. You just have evidence to reject the null hypothesis and you can therefore pose that perhaps the alternative hypothesis is correct. So I've just said here about t, um, about null and alternative hypothesis hypothesis, um, hypothesis for t-test and um, a log rank test. And now Dave is going to go into a bit more detail about this, but he might use slightly different um, hypotheses. Uh, next slide, please. Um, thanks. This is, so I'm going to talk <coughs> about p-values, which people often just apply as a kind of uh, recipe rather than actually understanding what they're doing and um, <coughs> the American Statistical Society did an analysis of uh, scientific articles and came to the conclusion that in more than half of them the p-value was um, misused and uh, even abused. Uh, so the uh, my, my discussion is based on this article by Duncan Murdoch and others uh, called p-values or random variables. If you want to look at it, then um, you can do so. Find the article using Google. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk about one particular test statistic uh, just to show you that these these things don't arrive by magic or by um, you, you can look them up in a book which, which test to use but they all have a logic behind them which um, by which they were derived um, they're not just found by experience so um, i'm imagining that we have x uh, uh, an unknown distribution, uh, sorry, an unknown distribution. But the only kind of thing you're allowed to do is to make a random draw. So, for example, um, <clears throat> if you have some hypothesis about uh, the effects on some treatment of mice, uh, then you might only be allowed to, according to Home Office regulations, which safeguard uh, the treatment of animals, you, they want you to use a minimum number of mice, so you might only be allowed to do your experiment on three mice. And uh, maybe the number of different experiments you can do is, is limited. So uh, I'm imagining a situation where you, the only thing you're allowed to do is to make a random draw from this distribution and uh, now what I'm going to talk about is how you get some idea of the value of the mean. Um, and that will this will enable us to derive a st test statistic, statistic and that test statistic can be used uh, to uh, compute p values for various different um, hypotheses. Um, so. Um, as usual, we denote the expectational mean of the distribution by mu and the standard deviation 
as sigma. And we're going to try to uh, get an idea of what it is by taking n random samples from x and later on we'll decide what some fixed value of n. So um, <coughs> these are uh, formal results from um, statistics and probability that the best guess for the mu is um, just to take the, the sample mean, sum the values that you get on n different experiments and divide by n. And the, uh, the sample standard deviation, the best guess for sigma is uh, given by this expression. You take the value you get on each experiment, subtract the mean, which I've defined just above, uh, square it and add the sum of the so this is kind of residual sum of squares. It's called our statisticians. And you have to divide by n minus 1 and then take the square root. There's a story I'm not going to tell about why you divide by n minus 1 rather than by n. Uh, but this is the correct number to divide by for the best guess for the standard deviation. Now, the, the true standard deviation of um, so that's a standard deviation for the sample. Here there's something slightly different, which is the standard deviation of uh, the mean. And for that you have to divide by the square root of n. Um, the, the best guess for the standard, so if we want the, the sigma there in the, the formula for the true standard deviation, sigma is unknown. So the best guess that we can make for the standard deviation of the mean is S divided by the square root of N. So then, uh, you know, I'm sure that everyone here has doing any kind of statistical analysis has gotten used to standardizing the list of data by dividing the mean and then dividing by the standard deviation and um, so that's where this formula comes from. You divide your estimate for the mean by the estimate for uh, the standard deviation and then you get this x bar divided by the square root of n divided by s. So that's some particular um, distribution that depends on the original x. It changes depending on what x is. And uh, that's the test statistic. The way you, uh, you evaluate it is you take a ra n random draws and then compute this formula. And, uh, and that's, uh, that, that's your test statistic for that particular experiment. Um, okay, next, next slide, please. Um, so here's so so first of all, as I said, you can substitute in any an, a known distribution to this test uh, statistic and see what you get. And um, what you get is something called um, uh, the, the t test with n minus one degrees of you get the t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. And uh, the right hand side here, t sub n minus one, I mean, this is not a theorem that these, this is a definition of what this distribution is. This is how um, the uh, student, the, the guy who wrote anonymously about this in the first place, um, defined, he got to this t test, this test uh, statistic by the reasoning I've just gone through. Um, and uh, so, the, so the, these are not p-values. These are just a test that gives you a number. If you're faced with a certain experiment, you can take in draws, do the n experiments, that is, work out this number, and then uh, see what it means in terms of the uh, this uh, t 
tea distribution. Um, so th these are not p-values. To get p-values, you have to do a certain transformation, which you can see from these, uh, the two diagrams on the left. So I've drawn in red something that represents some arbitrary distribution that we don't know. And th there's, there's a theoretical operation you can do for any value of x. You can take this area, which I've shaded in blue, and see what it comes to when you uh, compare with the uniform distribution. Uh, you take the same area and uh, this, this value at the bottom between 0 and 1 is called the, the cumulative distribution function. Um, the, uh, the curve that you see, usually see, the bell curve for the normal uh, distribution in black on the left uh, or, in, or in red uh, for the for the T distribution um, is given by differentiating this uh, this uh, cumulative distribution function. So um, and and it's 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 always positive. This area is always increasing as you move x to the right. So uh, the derivative is always positive. So that you, that's why. So you you see these curves on the left, always positive. And um, now, uh, so what we do is uh, um, right. I think I could go on to the next slide now. Um, so here, what I did, um, without or what Murdoch did, without um, specifically um, formulating any null hypothesis yet, you can get p-values before you before you have a null hypothesis, and I'm showing you the distribution. So these are. If you look in the bottom right, you can see what what this is about. So, what what are, what was done here is you t take the normal distribution for some different value of mu, and with um, with standard deviation one, and you do it a hundred k times. Um, so that's so that's a lot of times especially compared with a practical experiment, which you might do only once. Now, this is doing it 100k times. Now your one experiment is to make four draws from the uh, <coughs> four draws from the uh, distribution uh, of the normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation one, um, which uh, there's not very many draws to make, but it's one more than the Home Office allows you on mice. Um, so, uh, so here, so this to give you an idea of how this. So here we're looking at the the previous thing where we we're making. Uh, if you can remember the previous slide where we're making the distribution. Uh, of the test statistic uniform by using equality of areas. And here you see if um, so the, the negative values of mu are shown on the are come out on the left. Positive values of mu go come out on the right. So here's you make a histogram for each of these hundred thousand experiments. You get a single uh, a single number. So if it's less than 0 0.05, you put it in the left hand column. If it's between 0 0.5 and 0 0.1, you put it in the second column, like in any histogram. And uh, if you actually do this for when mu is minus one, when the mean is minus one, so you're looking at taking your draws from normal distribution mu with um, standard deviation one, then you get a histogram that looks like that. 
uh, the left top left one. Then the middle top is for um, the, the the value of mu is um, is point is point one, and um, uh, and then and then you'd get out of those hundred thousand, you'd get ninety two thousand nine hundred ninety five type two errors. That's how many we got. Which a type two error is when you auto reject it. So I should come clean now and say what particular uh, null hypothesis I'm using. And the particular null hypothesis is, as you see on the right, uh, the null hypothesis is that mu is greater than or equal to zero. So assuming the null hypothesis, you, you get a type two uh, error, which is that um, uh, that you that you ought to reject this because mu is negative and the null hypothesis is that it's positive. But in fact, you reject it uh, um, 92,995 times. Um, then, then uh, um, Oh, I, I, I don't know. I might have done that calculation wrong. Here, this shows the the uniformization process that I showed you on the previous slide. It shows that the chances of getting um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I said the wrong thing about that middle one. Uh, the thing is, if you're going to um, uh, refuse to, this is a type 2 error, you're refusing to reject, uh, you, you're not rejecting the null hypothesis, but you ought to reject it because mu is minus 1. And so this 92,995, you have to sum all those bins to the right because um, because uh, uh, you're much more likely to be to the right there and then, and then you'll ex then you'll fail to reject the null hypothesis, though you should have rejected it because mu is negative. Here, mu is zero, so you're right on the borderline, and you ought to um, accept it, but you don't accept it in uh, 4,968 uh, different experiments of your 100,000. So there's a reasonable chance you will reject it incorrectly. Now, now as you go, uh, as you as mu increases, um, you're you, you're going to do better with the uh, p-value. With here, when the when the mu when the mean is 0 0.5, you're going to get um, 679 type one errors. So they, we were looking at the extreme left one here, um, and uh, when mu equals one, you only get 42 type one errors. So there, if, if mu is one, you'd be in very good shape, getting a very, um, you, you're likely to get, well, you're likely to get one of these very high p-values uh, where this column is big. Um, so uh, what, this, what this is showing is that the p-values that you get are inevitably um, a random variable, and so uh, you, you're um, um, so and, and and so you can't kind of absolutely rely on your p-value um, unless it's convincing. You um, you can't you can't really come to a very firm conclusion, and so we're going to need this power analysis, which uh, Adam is going to talk on later in these with these slides. Thank you. That's that's it. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, David. So oh. I'm going to go into a bit more detail about. Um, so this is um, 
So this is. Are you, are you going to talk about this, Adam? Or yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit more detail about type one and type two errors, which you may have seen on um, David's slides towards the end. So to give a formal definition, a type one error is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when in actual fact the null hypothesis was true. So, and the probability of getting this is equal to alpha. So that's our significance level, which we um, we often put at 0 0.05. So if you see at the bottom here on the bottom left, we've got this blue distribution. And in this scenario, we randomly draw two different groups. So say a control and maybe an intervention arm. We've actually randomly sampled them from the same distribution. But we've um, but given the fact that they were from the same distribution, our inferential test or our, or our hypothesis test has told us to reject the null hypothesis. And um, we maybe have, and gives us the idea the alternative hypothesis is true, and that we've got two different distributions instead. So this is a type one error or a false positive. Um, next slide, please. And I'll go into a bit more detail on that with an example. So if let's say we've got two groups again, um, and if we see we, if we see the distribution on the top right, the blue curve, so this is a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Um, if we randomly sample one group, oh, I don't. Can everyone still see that slide? There we are. Don't worry. So if we randomly sample um, one group, so say the group in red, we take ten samples from this normally just normal distribution. And then we get a separate group, so this green group, and we randomly sample from this normal distribution again. We know that both of these two groups are from the same distribution. So if we did a test between them, we should get a non-significant p-value because we knew that the null hypothesis was correct. If we do a t-test between these two groups, so we've got 10 values in each of the group, we get a p-value of 0 0.25, which is fab. We haven't correctly, we've, um, it's not significant, so we've correctly accepted the null hypothesis. Um, next slide, please. So let's say we do that again and we pull another 10 another 10 values randomly for each group from the normal distribution and we do the test again this time we get p value 0 0.36 not significant again we've clearly accepted our hypothesis um, next slide please so we can do this loads of different times so after a third time here so you can see the values accumulating on the right and this time i get a p value 0 0.95 so again not significant with a correctly accepted normal hypothesis next slide please if we do this 20 times, then in actual fact, you can see the results on the right. Only on one of those occasions, I got a p-value that was less than 0 0.05. So exactly one out of 20, which is 5% of the time, we got a false positive. And this is the definition of a type 1 error. So I think it's a really important concept to be aware of when you do a statistical test. Um, next slide, please. And if we go back to what David showed us earlier, this is another example of where I've done 10,000 draws. So again, from this same distribution of two groups, um, two groups from the same distribution, roughly 5% of the time, which is our far left bin, we get a, um, we get a p value below 0 0.05. Uh, next slide, please. So the next error, which David mentioned, is a type two error. And again, to give a formal uh, definition, the type two error or a probability of type two error is the probability that we don't reject the null hypothesis where in actual fact the alternative hypothesis was true. And the probability of this is we call beta. So in this situation, if we have, if you look at the top graph, um, if we have two different distributions, then we need to sample, when we randomly draw cases for each of these two distributions, um, we need to have randomly drawn them from this sort of overlap area to, re to not reject the null hypothesis. So as I say, that's got a probability of beta. So what we you can see is we've got this adjacency matrix or confusion or a confusion matrix form, uh, forming. We've got the columns which are we um, the null hypothesis was true or it was false, and we've got the rows whether to accept or reject the null hypothesis. So in the first scenario, if we accept the null hypothesis when it was actually true, then we got it correct. Great. Um, in the second um, the second row, if we reject the null hypothesis when it was actually true, then we've made an error. It was a type one error. Probability of alpha. The total probability is equals one for, um, of course, over those two uh, sections. On the right column, when the null hypothesis was full, false, if we accept the null hypothesis, then we've made a type two error. So probability of beta. If we reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis was false, then we've got it correct. 
So the probability of this is intuitively one minus beta. And this is actually another important statistical term that you're going to see here, which is one minus beta. I'm going to actually call it the power. Next slide, please. So I've introduced three different terms here. So the first one is a probability of a type one error, which we call alpha. We've then got a probability of a type two error, which we call beta. And then we've got power. And this is the probability that we check the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis was actually true. So this is one minus beta. So what we want to, what we want to know about power is that the higher the power we have, the more likely we are to declare the groups different when they're truly different. And I'll give them an example on the next slide. So again, if I've got a I've got two different distributions, I've got the red and the green. And in this situation, we've got a mean value of, of zero and one of them, some deviation of one. And we've got a mean value of one, some deviation of one in the other distribution. Let's say I randomly sample two different groups from these two different distributions. And I use just four subjects. So I randomly draw four samples from the red group, four samples from the, uh, the green group or the green distribution. And if we use the simulations that David showed again earlier, you can actually see that we've got the highest probability of getting a probability of getting a p-value below 0 0.05. However, in total, we're more likely to get um, values greater than 0 0.05 and to reject the null, and sorry, to reject, um, to not reject the null hypothesis because most of the time we'll get a p-value that's greater than 0 0.05. So this is an underpowered study. We didn't have enough subjects to, um, to trust the p-value that we got at the end. If you see the example on the right, if we instead use 400 subjects, so we randomly sample 400 subjects from the, um, the red distribution, randomly sample 400 subjects from the green distribution, and we do an inferential test between them, then we actually get, in 10,000 attempts, we get 10,000 times a p-value below 0 0.05. So this is a well-powered study. So I think this is really important to understand because if you think of a low-powered study, this isn't what we want. We don't want this. We don't want... To, to get p-values that are high that are actually incorrect in a sense. Whereas on the right, we're correctly getting low p-values for our distributions and correctly identifying that our distributions are different. Uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna go into a lot more detail later about an actual power analysis. The final uh, term I wanted to introduce was the effect size. And I've already told you that a p-value tells us whether to reject or accept a null hypothesis, but it doesn't tell us anything about the magnitude or the effect of the analysis. Um, sorry, of the intervention or whatnot. Instead, that's the effect size does this. This tells us the strength of our evidence. Um, so if we've got two distributions, again, if they're quite close together, i.e. the means very similar, then we've got a small effect size. If they're quite far apart, like on the right, then we can have a large effect size. Now, a formula for effect size isn't quite just the, dis the difference in means, uh, but there's multiple different ways of calculating it. One of the most common ones is Cohen's D. But in a survival analysis, we typically use a hazard, race, uh, hazard ratio, which uh, Rob will talk about in a bit. Um, Hello. 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 So just to recap, we've talked about hypothesis tests, that a hypothesis test has a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. We talked about a type one error, we talked about type two errors, and we talked about the power. I've, I've mentioned that the p-value tells us whether to reject or, or to not reject, reject the null hypothesis um, based on the p-value. And something that I wanted to highlight there is that the p-value is either significant or is not significant. You see so many studies that say the p-value approached significance or the p-value was very significant. That's not the case. It's, it's the p-value was below 0 0.05 or it was above. There's no in-between. To find out how, how well, to find out the effects of the study, to find out how what the difference was between the two di different distributions, then we need an effect size. And this gives us the strength of our evidence. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so uh, we'll start with the life cycle of a survival analysis project. The, uh, this idea, the first thing is that you have an idea and then you want to see if that is correct. Uh, you uh, form your hypothesis and to support that hypothesis, to test that hypothesis, you need some data. The data collection uh, in case of medical um, 
feel is that the, the records are not uh, uh, readily available. They are unstructured and distributed, so you need to collect those uh, records uh, that are relevant to the study or your hypothesis. Once you have the data, you can extract some features from the data, for example, lymphocytic count or other cell communities, different uh, types of features you extract, and based on those features, you uh, try to model the, um, the survival analysis, your FITA model, usually in the kaplan mer or any other um, um, survival model like um, proportional hazard. Uh, once you fit a model, then you analyze your results and based on these results, you can identify visual patterns uh, in the, for example, in the two group, what is the, what is the difference in the lymphocytic uh, clustering or other biomarker discovery. And next slide, please. So the survival analysis actually is the study of survival times, but it also involves other factors that can influence this, the survival times. And as this, you already heard a lot of uh, terminologies in the previous presentation. So to be good on the survival analysis, you will need some basic statistical theory, uh, what is sample, what are distributions, what is hypothesis, and uh, conditional probabilities, uh, some principle of regression and categorical data analysis. The, the goal of the survival analysis uh, could be that you want to estimate the uh, probability of survival over a certain period of time, or you want to estimate the hazard function you want to com compare to survival distribution, if they are same, if they are different, and you want to assess the effect of different factors on the survival time. Next slide, please. So the survival time is actually the uh, response variable that we are trying to estimate given the data we have. It's non-negative, uh, discrete, uh, or continuous random variable. It can take on uh, different values from a distribution, but that's not known. And uh, this represents the time from a well-defined origin. Or from the origin, this can be like uh, the study starts with um, uh, after the surgery, or you say, okay, after a treatment, and you want to study uh, the patients up to a certain time, and then you are looking for uh, an event that occurs uh, to this patient. The event can be, for example, death or relapse uh, of, of a disease etc. And we know all that these are just estimates. These, um, these can be affected by a lot of uh, other factors, the age, tumor size, sex, uh, and the number of lymph nodes, etc. Next slide. This one difficulty when we are dealing with this survival data that is called censoring. And this happens when the starting or ending events are not precisely observed. We just know that the event has occurred, but we don't have the exact time of that event. And the most common of these is the right censoring. So when the final endpoint is only known to exceed a particular value, then we say the data is right sensor. If we look at the figure on the x-axis, we have the number of weeks. So in this case, the individual B is right censored because the event hasn't occurred to this individual till the censoring time, which is 12 weeks. For the individual A, the event has occurred between four and six weeks, so this is non-censored. And this right censoring can also occur if the, uh, the individual has withdrawn from the study or the individual is lost to a follow up. So in that case, this is also censored because we are not sure when that event has occurred to the individual or it will occur or not. Next slide, please. There, there are two other types of censoring uh, which are less common. One is left censoring, in which case, if you look at the figure, if an individual already had a uh, um, suffer the event and enters the study that is a left censoring. In case of interval censoring, uh, we know that the event has occurred, uh, but we are not sure um, what exact point into intervals that event has occurred. 
Next slide, please. Now the basic principle was the survival function. It is the probability of surviving up to a certain time t. And uh, this, uh, if you look at the figure, uh, for example, uh, we want to see what's the probability of surviving up to, uh, let's say, two months on the x-axis you see at two months. Then you can see on the y-axis that the probability of surviving up to, up to two months is 0.9. And we get, so in the, in the later slides, we will see how this is actually calculated. But for now, we can see that this survival function is actually at the product of the uh, probabilities, the survival probabilities up to a certain time. And in this equation, if you look here, the di is the, the number of events that occurred uh, uh, up to that point of time. And this is divided by the number of, of individual that actually survived till this point. So this di over ni is the, the hazard rate. And when we say one minus this hazard rate, we say how many of them are surviving up, up to this time t. Now, if you look at the plot, at s times zero, we see that the probability of surviving is 100%, which means no patient has died yet. And we see the function is non-increasing with, with this passage of time, the probability is going down for survival, and it's always uh, greater than or equal to zero. Now, one thing, uh, sorry, so one thing to note about this uh, survival plot, we will see these uh, vertical bars, for example, uh, at week three and four, we see two vertical bars. These mean that these uh, there are events that were censored during this time. And when there's a drop in the in the plot, we see that certain event has occurred at that time. Okay, next slide, please. Now, this is uh, another very important related function that is called hazard function. And it's um, so in the previous the survival function was trying to see what's the probability of surviving up to a certain time, but the hazard function tries to see what's the probability of dying, of not surviving at the very next interval of time. So it's actually the given that the individual has survived up to a certain time, uh, it's the probability of dying at the very next time. And it's related to the survival in terms of the uh, derivative of the uh, inverse of the survival function, which means that if we have the survival function, we can uh, get the hazard function as well. And it tries to measure how much the slope of the survival function relative to the value of the survival function. And uh, going back from a hazard function to survival function, we integrate the hazard function from uh, the, the starting point till that time, and we will get the survival function. Now, uh, one point regarding this hazard uh, rate or hazard function is that it's also non-negative, but it has no upper bound. So if you look at the plot, plot D, which is the survival probability. Uh, so it ranges from zero to one. The probability goes from zero to one, but for the hazard, which is actually a rate and not a probability, there's no upper bound. And it is, um, uh, you, if you look at this, um, the survival probability curve in plot D, uh, initially there's a, a very slow uh, a decrease in the survival probability but with the time this um, survival probability is rapidly going, going down and that is observed in the hazard function uh, going very up uh, uh, quickly in the in the last part of this okay so this the hazard so we are as mentioned that the um, survival um, probability and these two um, functions are related. The hazard function we'll see in the next slide and uh, exactly how they are. Yeah, so if you look at this plot, uh, it says that from the survival function, we can obtain 
the hazard function by taking the negative log derivative of the survival function and taking the um, exponential of the integral from a certain time from uh, the origin to certain time of the hazard function we can get the survival function and this this hazard function give much more information like uh, for example how likely is a machine uh, to fail when it has survived up to a certain time and giving the relative slope of the survival curves and it uh, can take other covariates into account which we will see later on in the cox proportional hazard model okay next slide please so this again uh, interpreting those hazard functions next slide please these plots uh, showing how uh, the survival curves and the hazard are related in a and b we see initially is a high hazard and in plot C and D, we can see initially there is a low hazard because of the uh, slope, because of the probability of the survival going very slowly, but rapidly in the later phases. That's why the hazard in plot C is going very up. Next slide. This is the same example as Faz mentioned, the, the uh, time to violent death. Uh, the hazard has increased uh, during the time 12 years and 16 years, and that is also shown by the survival probability uh, going rapidly down during that time. So they are interrelated to, to each other, and you can get the hazard from the survival uh, function and survival from the hazard function. And next slide, please. So some problems uh, when dealing with these uh, functions we don't have a continuous estimate of the survival or, uh, or the hazard function and the survival times are discrete and as we saw they are censored mostly and they also involve the effect of other other covariates uh, which you, we need to take into account when we are doing the survival uh, analysis so how we get it from the data, uh, we'll see in the next slides. Uh, that's all from my side, thank you. Okay, thank you, Noor. So I'm going to um, talk a little, just rephrase a little bit, so, and talk about how we go from those problems you mentioned to applying these survival curves from the, the data we have. So the su survival curve Noor talked about earlier is something is a, estimated called the Captain Meyer estimator. So this is, in this scenario, you assume that all of the different um, events or failure times for the participants in your, in your sample are independent. And from that, you get this estimator, this discrete estimator for the survival probabilities um, at each time step. So you're, you estimate um, from your data what the survival probability S of T is for um, the times larger than T. And you sum over all the times where at least one event has happened, so that's why you have that um, summation for t sub um, i uh, less than or equal to t. So next slide. So just to show a bit of an example with this, let's say we have a trial with um, 20 patients, each with um, advanced stage um, stomach cancer. So I just provided a sample of the data here, so you have, you know um, when each time events are, some of them are censored, some of them are not, um, and you know when those events took place. So in the 48 month study, at what month did an event occur or was censored due to other circumstances? So you can see a, a sample of those in the example on the right here. So next slide. So then taking the um, survival formula from earlier and applying it in this case, we can generate um, the survival, uh, the Captain Meyer estimate for the survival curve for this group. And so, what you, so it, to give an example for the first data point, you know that the number of um this is, you know at month eight you know that the number of individuals still alive is is one person has died so you know the number of deaths is one and the number of people who were still alive at that point is 20. so one minus one over 20 is 0.95 and you do 0.95 times the survival probability at the original time step s of t which is one so that's how you get the 0.95 and then you keep applying this for every single example you have in order 
all the way through to, to generate the plot on the right. And you can also plot confidence at S intervals for this, which I'll go into in a bit more detail later on. So next uh, slide. Sorry, Rob, there's a question. Oh, can, sorry, go ahead. Can we go back to previous slide? Just one uh, bit of clarification here. So mm -hmm. data that you've shown on the right hand side, I don't see an event at 12 months. Yeah, no, so these are just from the entire sample. Um, I just put a sub, I just put them in order on the left and this, um, I, these are just from the entire 20 participants. So they're not exactly the same for all of them. Okay. And yeah, so then what you can do with this is you can explore how the survival curves vary for different groups. So in this, with this same study, they half the participants were given chemotherapy before surgery and the other half of the participants were given chemotherapy after surgery. So if we then stratify the original data by these two different groups, we can generate the two, two different survival curves as shown on as shown on the right. So we just follow the same process before and then we generate the blue curve for if they receive chemotherapy after surgery and the red curve for if they receive chemotherapy before surgery. So this would indicate from those two survival curves that at all points in, the, in our um, study, the, the group of patients with chemotherapy after surgery have a survival probability that is higher um, than the group with chemotherapy before surgery. So next slide. But, and this is kind of part of a more general point in survival analysis where you frequently want to compare um, how the survival probabilities differ between different groups. And that cannot, that can be, as I mentioned in that example, on the previous slide, um, in examples of control versus a different um, treatment perspective or, um, or drug trials. And even more beyond that, you, want, you may want to compare how other effects and covariates impact that, things such as age, sex, pre-existing conditions like diabetes, etc. And this is a very common um, task in survival analysis and you can use it for other tasks like subgrouping. So you can stratify and decide on treatment for patients depending on what their, what their level of risk is and their survival probabilities are. So for example, if they're below a certain threshold, some patients may need chemotherapy, but um, if they're above a, a many surgery, but if they're below a certain threshold, they may only need chemotherapy instead. So you can decide on high versus low risk by doing that. So next slide, please. So now, so now I'm going to come on to the statistical tests that um, Adam and David talked a bit about earlier. So we've, ge we've generated these two survival curves. We've generated survival curves for different groups, but we want to be able to test, are these actually statistically significant differences? because in the example I talked about earlier, there were only 20 participants. So does that result, that indication that the two groups, there is a difference in survival probability between them hold outside of those 20 individuals? So the way we do this is very similar to um, a chi-squared test. So we said that the, our null hypothesis is that, um, as I'm saying, like, like in the innocent to proven guilty scenario, there is no statistical difference in the survival outcomes for two or more of the groups. and our, our, an alternative hypothesis is that there is a statistical difference between the two. So this, there are different versions of the log rank test, but the most common one I'm going to talk about is this one, which um, assumes that your data is approximately distributed as a chi-squared test with one degree of freedom. So uh, next slide, please. So just to reiterate again, for, um, for these two cases, we're going to test, uh, are these two curves statistically different outside of just these 20 participants? And we're going to our null hypothesis that they're not, and our alternative hypothesis that they are statistically different with our significance level of alpha of 0 0.05, as Adam talked about earlier. Next slide, please. So the way we do this is we need to compute our test statistic um, from the chi-squared distribution for um, from both sets of data, and we need to then compare this for our chosen um, p-value within the critical tables for the degree of freedom relevant to one. So in this case, the test statistic comes out to be 6.151. And we can look up in the um, chi-square distribution table for our um, p-value of 0 0.05, that, that is 3.841. So in this case, because our test statistic is, uh, is greater than three in significance level from the p-value table, we know we can reject the null hypothesis. 
um, from these two. So this would give us evidence that there is a statistically significant difference between the two groups of treatment. So next slide. Another way we can also compare survival times is to use the confidence intervals I talked about earlier. So these are estimated using um, something called Greenwood's formula, which I won't go through all the detail now, but it's a, bit, it's a way of estimating the variance and you can use that to generate confidence intervals between the two. So this is more useful in this example because you can see that once you um, the time in months gets longer than 30, there is a decent amount of overlap in the confidence intervals between the two groups. So while you've statistically proven with the log rank test that there is a different there's a statistical difference in survival probability between the two groups on, on the whole on the whole for the, among these 20 participants there's you have much you have more uncertainty in the, in the range of 30 to 40 weeks in particular because of the overlap of these confidence intervals so next slide so that's looking at just um, two different variations between groups but of course in the real world there are huge numbers of different um, factors that may impact things. So age, pre-existing conditions, different environments, different treatment patterns, um, different conditions in living, all, all these other factors. And most of the time we want to be able to explore how all of these individually impact um, survival probability for different groups. We want to do a multivariate analysis of um, our, our data and look at all, as many factors as we can to try and um, understand as much as possible to what's going on. So how do we do this? So if we go to the next slide. The most common way is to use something called a proportional hazard model, which is effectively a type of regression model in survival analysis, where you assume that the um, hazard for, hazard um, for a group at each time step um, is, has an effect that's based off something called a baseline hazard, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and that, that, is, that is multiplicative effect with all your covariates and, and their parameters, which you um, which you have to model and fit in, in different ways, which I'll come on to. Go to the next slide. So the most common proportional hazard model is something called the Cox model. Now this was invented by um, this this chap called Sir David Cox, who also um, did some work on binary logistic regression. So in it, you have the um, baseline hazard h sub naught of t, as as mentioned earlier, and you assume that this all the hazard at any point is a multiplicative relationship between a set of covariates. So those are your x1, x2, or your matrix formula, big X in the second equation, and their individual parameters, these beta, these beta values. And it's a, the reason it's very popular is that it's a semi-parametric model. So there's no, you don't have to assume um, the baseline hazard has a particular shape or distribution because you can estimate it non-parametric. There are also, are also parametric ways of estimating it, but you don't have to necessarily. And, and additionally, you don't have to um, assume that the survival times themselves follow a particular statistical distribution, which is quite, which is very helpful when you aren't so sure about um, those aspects of your data. So next slide, please. So the baseline hazard is um, the, the, the key feature on what this model is built on. So it, it's assumed to be um, the hazard of all subjects in the population without the covariates um, involved. So if everything, so in, for example, if you're comparing just you've only one covariate, so say whether someone um, smokes or they do not, and that's the only covariate you're taking into account, the baseline hazard is purely what the um, hazard rate is for an individual living in the world, regardless of whether they smoke or not, just going about their day-to-day -day lives. And this is most commonly estimated in a non-parametric way using something called a, a Bressler estimator, um, which is uses which is very similar to the uh, survival probability and the Kaplan-Meier estimator that I talked about earlier. But um, it's a way of generating uh, this formula without having to actually fit parameters to the data itself. And the Cox model is built on um, this idea that the this baseline hazard determines the hazard at every time step and all the other covariates purely act in a multiplicative way. So and hence, they're all proportional to this baseline hazard rate. So next slide, please. So now that we, um, so when you've determined the baseline hazard rate, H sub naught of T, 
then all you need to all you need to do to fit the model is determine all the beta parameters for all your different um, covariates, depending on how many you may have. So the way the way that you do this is you maximize the likelihood that um, the beta you maximize the likelihood for the beta values, which is this ratio of um, the but the uh, you maximize the, the likelihood for these um, the parameters for a given um, individual compared to the sum of all the hazards for across all the individuals on the bottom. And you do this using um, the newton raphson method. So you um, fit all the beta values to maximize the likelihood that you get um, the best, uh, best outcome from this. So next slide, please. So when you, you can rearrange um, this equation uh, for the cost portion hazard model to get these called hazard ratios that were mentioned earlier. So these are um, what the what the model is built on, so to speak, in a way. So they determine what the role of each coefficient is. So if it's the way of assessing the relative risk between two different groups or two different um, variables within, within your model itself. So if you're once you know your baseline hazard rate, then you, you can your beta value will change what multiplicative effect that covariate has on that hazard rate. So if your beta value is greater than zero, um, or great, and then your exponential will be positive and you will increase the hazard rate. Whereas if it's less than zero, then you will decrease the hazard rate. Obviously, if it is zero, then it will stay the same. So you don't um, affect the hazard rate in any particular way. Next slide, please. And so fundamentally, you can view this whole Cox portion hazard model as a linear maximum likelihood estimator of the log of this hazard ratio. So all you have to do is um, rearrange the equation, just log take the logarithm of both sides of the equation, and you can rearrange it to get these coefficients of these hazard ratios, which are, um, if you go to the next slide. So just to give a quick example of this, using that original example, we had um, of our two different groups of treatments, so chemotherapy before and chemotherapy after. If you compute the, um, the hazard ratio for these two groups, you come out with hazard ratio of 4.87. So what this means is you've determined that the group with chemotherapy before instead of chemotherapy after are 4.87 times more likely to die at a given time than the group with chemotherapy after. So that's quite an intuitive way of interpreting these two, these two curves. Next slide, please. So let's give a, another example of this. Let's say we have, we have let's say we have some data here. Um, this is on from a paper in published in 1980, looking at convicts and release in Maryland, where half of them were given financial help as an experiment to see whether this would decrease their likelihood of being arrested again, and half would not. But you also have all this other information. So you have information about their age, their work experience, whether they were married, um, etc. So you can plot the two survival curves, as I've shown here, um, but as you can see, the confidence intervals overlap significantly. So we want to determine, and also we want to determine how do these other factors influence um, their survival outcome as well. So let's, if we fit a Cox um, model to this, on the next slide, please. Yeah, so we can then plot these, um, the log of these hazard ratio covariates, which are the, which are the coefficients of the Cox model in order to measure the effect each of these individual um, features has on the model output. So if we take the example of the prior feature, so the second from the top there, we can see that this has a slightly um, positive um, log of the hazard ratio. So what this works out to be is if you, for every one unit you increase the um, number of priors you've had, so if, an, if all other variables remain the same, but a convict who's just been released has had one prior arrest, then they have a log hazard ratio of 0 0.09. So when you plug that into um, the formula, so you do e to the minus, is um, e to the 0 0.09, this works out to be a 10% increase overall in, in the hazard. So they are 10% more likely to be arrested again if they just have one more prior arrest compared to all of the other features staying the same. Next slide. So if you look at some of the other, other features, for example, um, the marriage one, which is quite stand up by a very large confidence interval. While on average, um, it, 
in the median, you this has a very positive effect. So you have a 35%, was that to be a 35% reduction in your overall hazard um, if you were married when you were released. You can see that the confidence was very wide. So maybe not all marriages are created equal among convicts in the in 1970s in America. I'm not sure, but there's definitely some variation in this one. But the key point here with this is that this is a feature that can violate the proportional hazard assumption that I mentioned earlier. So the, the model assumes that all these features stay the same throughout, but someone can be released so, so that you, when you know that someone was binary married or not, zero or one, when they were released, but they can also get married in the 52 weeks which they're followed up um, afterwards. So then this assumption is violated and the, the interpretation of some of their results um, are less useful in that regard. So next slide, please. The final thing we can do is we can, given the model we have, plot how the survival curves vary for a single covariate while we hold all our variables constant. So in this case, I plotted how if you vary the number of priors um, an individual or participant has, you can plot their different survival curves using the Kaplan-Meier estimator I talked about earlier. So you can see here as the number of priors increases, the overall survival probability curve shifts downwards, which is in keeping in trends with um, studies that show when um, participants are released from prison or they're much more likely to relapse if they've been there before. But you can also see the dotted black curve um, of the baseline. So this is what the, using the Breslow est estimator, the model has fitted as its um, baseline hazard rate for the overall um, for the overall population. And you can also see that when the number of priors is zero, you actually um, have a, it's actually has a negative effect so in terms of overall. So you actually survival probability is better if you've had no priors, but it assumes that your baseline hazard is more than that. So clearly um, there were many more convicts with prior offences than not. So thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to Amina, who's going to talk a bit about now that we have these models, how do we actually determine um, how good their results actually are? So thank you. Thank you, Rob, and hi, everyone. So assuming that you now have a survival model, be it a computational model or be it some simulation of the Grim Reaper who can tell how likely an individual is supposed to survive, uh, how to evaluate the predictions generated by that survival model. So when we have a survival model, we may ask some questions like the ones listed here on the screen. For example, how good is the score, the prediction score produced by our model or the risk score good for performing tasks like stratification? That is dividing our data into groups based on the risk. For example, high risk patients and low risk patients, or just like uh, in the previous example as given by Rob, into patients, uh, sorry, uh, into different groups of um, patients. So another question that you might ask is how accurate are the predictions that your model is generating in comparison to the actual survival? That is, what are what is the difference between the actual and the predicted survival probabilities? And are the values that your model pr is producing, are they well calibrated? Do they lie in the range that uh, is that can actually be uh, used for validation across multiple cohorts? Next slide, please. So um, for this presentation, I actually dug into a lot of literature and there are there is a huge number of uh, performance statistics that can be used for evaluation of a model, but uh, we as machine learning scientists, uh, especially the type of the types of studies that we come across, there is only a handful of statistics that we see in those studies. So I'm naming uh, some uh, performance statistics here, but I'll be going into detail for only one or two of these. Um, based on the type of evaluation that we can perform, these evaluation metrics can be categorized into two broad groups. One of them is discrimination. That is how good is our model 
able to distinguish between high risk and low risk. And some of the uh, performance metrics that are used for this purpose are p-values, c-indices, ROC curves, and a lot of other uh, performance metrics. Next, please. Another kind of performance statistics are the ones that tell us how good is the fit of the model and uh, how, how well calibrated is our model. Uh, these essentially compute the difference between the actual survival probabilities and the predicted ones. And you can use measures like Briar score, R2 measures, calibration scores, and all these other performance metrics listed over here for this purpose. Next, please. So there has been quite an extensive discussion about p-values in the previous slides, but uh, just for the sake of completion, uh, I'll just define uh, it uh, in very simple terms. Uh, p-values simply put is, how likely is it that an observed difference between two groups is due to chance? For example, uh, on the right, you see uh, two survival curves, uh, as in the example uh, explained by Rob uh, in the previous slides. So you see two survival curves and you see a p-value of 0 0.0085 mentioned here. Now you see that there is quite a difference between these blue and uh, orange curves. What does this value of 0 0.0085 mean? It means that there is a probability of 0.85% that we might observe this separation by chance. That is what this p-value is telling us, and that is what the word signif statistically significant means. So in this case, we know that there is a statistically significant chance of observing a separation between these two groups, but we don't have any quantification of how good that separation is. Next, please. So the p-values, they don't explain everything. They are telling you that the difference is statistically significant, but they're not telling you how good is the discrimination between the two groups. And yes, koalas are cute. Next, please. So one of the ways that we can, uh, we can evaluate the discrimination ability of a model is via concordance index also known as C index. For some reason, statisticians like to use uh, alphabets uh, a lot. So there is C statistic and there are D statistics and there are T statistics and C statistics and so on. Anyway, so concordance index, uh, well, as its name suggests, it measures concordance between the predicted and the actual uh, survivals. So in, before defining it, let me just tell, give you an idea of how it is computed and uh, that would help you uh, understand it better. So on top right, you can see some data points where we have the actual survival times for five data points for five individuals, and we have some prediction scores generated by a model for them. For measuring concordance index, we have to compute the number of concordant pairs and we have to compute the number of total pairs inside a data set. So what is meant by concordant pairs? Uh, next, please. So if you choose a pair, let's say we have Alice and Dave. Now, if you look at the data set, the, the actual survival time for Alice is less than that for Dave. And our model produces a value of three, which is less than a value produced for Dave, that is five. This means that the predictions are in agreement with the original values, and therefore the pair of Alice and Dave is concordant. Similarly, next please. Uh, yes, there is a question from Nasser. Please go ahead. Just a quick point here. I mean, the score can be um, actually the opposite of uh, um, rest, right? So, yes. So in that case, you would compare one minus P for the individuals, right? Or exactly. Something. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
So the so uh, in here, I, I, I should have cleared this point first. Over here, we are assuming that the predicted scores are survival probabilities, uh, not the not the risk scores, in fact. OK, so uh, in, in the next example, if you take uh, the example of uh, Alice and Bob, so you can see that the actual observed times for uh, Alice is less than that of Bob. That is one is less than two, but the predicted score in this case for Alice is greater than that for Bob and therefore this pair is discordant. So if you look at this data set, we have actually 10 pairs in all and out of those 10 pairs, six of those are concordant and therefore we have a concordance index of 0.6. So to put uh, simply, concordance index is it measures how good your model is at ranking your data samples. Uh, one thing, one small point that that should be considered here is that uh, if, if you look at the definition, I say that it's the ratio of concordant pairs to comparable pairs. So not so every every pair is cannot be considered while computing this concordance index uh, for a pair to be permissible to be used uh, in computation of concordance indices. You have to make sure that the sample with lower observed time has experienced the event. That is the event has been observed for uh, the individual with lower observed time while computing C index. So yes, this is how C index is computed and to interpret it, uh, if you if you're getting a concordance index of around 0 0.5, it means your model is no good at uh, predicting survival as a coin flip would be, uh, is, is as good as a coin flip would be. So that is its performance is random. Uh, for a perfect model, you'd get higher values and for a perfect model, you'll get a concordance index of one. There has been a lot of research on uh, impact of uh, different characteristics of data on C indices and uh, I'll not go into the detail, but uh, just to summarize, it has been found that C indices can produce overly optimistic numbers in case of high amounts of censoring. So if there is a large number of censored examples in your data, you may not want to use just this Harrell's C index. There have been other uh, modifications to this index, one of them being UNO's uh, C index to take care of uh, such problems. Next, please. Yes. Uh, there's a question from Nasser, I guess. Uh, just a point, really. Um, I mean, the, the C index, I can see how it can be calculated for uh, multiple different subgroups, right? So even if you have three, four, five subgroups, mm -hmm. you, you can still calculate C index because all you need to do is um, calculate yep. the number of yes. starting pairs, right? But how do you calculate p-value for more than two subgroups? Because the description so far has focused on two subgroups, right? So, so high risk and low risk. What if you have a medium risk or, you know, more than three groups? Uh, th then how, how do you go about calculating the p-value? As, as for p-value computation, uh, as far as I understand, and if we, uh, I think we do it in a pairwise fashion, that is one versus the rest. Uh, as as far as I remember reading about it, but if someone else uh, can can uh, chime in here, it, it would be nice. So it's typically either either pairwise or one versus all comparison. OK, so if you have three groups, you will calculate three P values, three yes. certain P values and then Take the average of that. The average or some other measure that you you can use to combine those values. It depends upon what you're trying to measure. So if you if you want to measure one of the statistic one of the groups is statistically significant from the, all the rest of them, then you can take the minimum. And if you say that all of the groups are uh, uh, significantly different from each other, then you may want to threshold the maximum of the p values. Uh, so even if one of them is not significant, you would say that yes, uh, there is no significant difference observed. I mean, so, what's normally done? So so when you have 
three or four groups in, in your survival curves, then what, do you know what people normally do? I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% uh, sure on a single p-values. I haven't come across any anything like that, but there may be. Uh, uh, at least I'm not aware of any. Well, I mean, in literature, when you have more than two um, survival curves, you see p-values associated with those as well. Uh, so I'm just wondering how they calculate those single values for multiple different curves. Yeah, I've, I've seen those. I've seen multiple different curves with a single p-value associated, but uh, I'm not sure right now about how. So I know they are computed in pairwise or one versus all fashion, but uh, I'll have to get back to you on how those multiple p-values are combined to form a single measure. So. OK, thank you. Next slide, please. OK, uh, another in the interest of time, I'll, I'll try to be quick here. Uh, another measure. So, so the problem with C indices is that it, it, it can tell you how good your model is at ranking stuff, but it does not tell you the exact difference between the values produced by your model and the actual survival probabilities. So for that purpose, you have uh, something known as a Breyer score. It is basically a time dependent uh, analysis of errors uh, between the survival prediction and the actual survival status. So on the right, you can see the formula used to compute it. Uh, this S hat TXI is basically the survival probability produced by the model you fit. And I of TI greater than T is whether uh, is, is the survival status at that particular point in time. So worst case scenario is like, uh, the survival probability of let's say you 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 have a random uh, number generator and you're getting a survival probability of 0 0.5 and the status is let's say uh, the status uh, is 1 here so you'll get 1 minus 0 0.5 and and if you square it you'll get a value of around 0.25 in case of a purely random model so and since this is an error measure, we want the numbers to be small. So they should typically be smaller than uh, 0 0.25 uh, because 0 0.25 typically uh, represents a random model. Uh, another thing, again, without going into too much detail, uh, according to the literature, these tests, these scores favor tests uh, with higher specificity if the prevalence of events, if the number of uh, examples where the events has occurred is low. Uh, next slide, please. Then for those of you uh, who who might have uh, encou encountered some regression studies, there is something known as an R squared uh, statistic. It is typically used to measure uh, correlation for uh, uh, regression problems, and it's also known as a coefficient of determination. What it actually measures is the percentage variation in your so percentage of the variation in the data that is explained by your model as compared to the whole variation present in your data. That is what fraction of the data lies on the model you have fit. This is what simple coefficient of determination measures in case of linear regression. Now, the, the, the reason that we cannot use it as is for survival uh, analysis is that it does not model time and it does not uh, take care of censoring problems. So one of the ways that can be tackled is to use uh, instead of using simple sum of squared errors as they use in uh, R squared for regression, we might use some survival friendly error functions. For example, the one we just talked about, that is the Breyer score. So if if so over here on the right, you can see uh, the formula for R squared statistic based on the Breyer score for survival analysis. So uh, it's equal to one minus the error of the model you fit divided by the error of the baseline model where the where you're assuming the value of uh, your covariates is zero. Next slide, please. 
OK, uh, the last thing I'll be talking about in terms of performance evaluation is calibration of the model to see uh, if the values that your model is producing, if those are in agreement with the ones that we actually want to see. That is the true values. One of the ways to do that, assuming that your model is based on a Cox proportional hazards model, is that you fit another Cox proportional hazards model using the prediction values you are getting. So you estimate this survival slope by fitting a Cox model to the survival outcomes with the predicted values that you are getting with your model and you will get some values. Once your model is fitted, you'll get some values for this parameter alpha one. Now this the values we get for this alpha one will tell us how well our model is calibrated. If these values are close to one, it means that we we are good. Our model is well calibrated, but if it's very small, it might hint at overfitting and it might hint at an, a need for recalibration. Another way to look at how a good a model is calibrated is via visual inspection. You may want to plot uh, your predicted versus survival values, or you may want to plot the quantiles for your predicted and uh, actual survival values. Next, please. So you may get a plot like this. This is what a QQ plot. Q here is uh, for quantiles. So you may want to see how, uh, what, what types of plots you get when you plot uh, the quantiles of actual versus predicted values. And ideally, you want them to be in on this uh, thick black line you see uh, any any uh, di divergence from here uh, would mean that yeah perhaps some sort of calibration might be needed next please okay uh, one another thing that i uh, there there are a number of other performance metrics that are used in statistical survival analyses. In the interest of time, I was not able to cover more than that, but uh, I definitely suggested uh, looking at uh, other survival measures, other other measures uh, in your in your free time if you get. Uh, now I'd, I'd quickly talk about some caveats and biases of the survival metrics that we use or the types of analysis that we perform, and one of the most prevalent ones is multiple testing. So for example, you were able to produce a set of thousand features and you keep on testing one feature at a time. That is, you perform a thousand tests to find any significantly prognostic feature of those 1000. Now, if your p-value cutoff is set at 0 0.05, that means you may get 50 features to be significant by chance. And that's a big number. So what to do then? One of the ways to take care of such problem is via Bonferroni correction and uh, where it suggests that you divide uh, the cutoff value by the number of tests you are about to perform. That is, we have a cutoff value of 0 0.05. We divide it by 1000 and we get uh, 5 into 10 raised to the power minus uh, 5, I guess. So we will we we uh, lower the threshold. However, it's too conservative. So another so another way, another better way, relatively better way when we can accept some uh, false positives, which we typically can, is via Benjamin Hodgeberg procedure. And uh, I've I've added a link to uh, how this procedure is performed in the slide, but this can. Uh, get you an effective control over false discovery rate. So if you have a large number of features and you are performing uh, multiple testing, you might want to perform these corrections before uh, deeming anything statistically significant on, on the typical threshold of 0.05. Next, please. OK, this is a, a very interesting resource I came across while looking for caveats and biases in survival prediction, and this is known as a catalog of biases. Uh, it is uh, an initiative by a group at University of Oxford, and they here have listed all possible biases that they have yet come across in, in uh, statistical studies. So since uh, we don't have much time to go through all of these, uh, I just selected one of the one of such biases that you might 
uh, come across in survival based studies. Next slide, please. And that is known as the immortal time bias. Now consider you have two patients who are enrolled into a survival study at the same time. One of them is given the treatment and the other one is not. And you want to uh, compare the effect of the treatment on those two groups or on those two patients. Now there might be something that you don't know while recording the observation or you just uh, overlooked it and that might be that the treatment begins after some time. It doesn't begin right after the patient was enrolled in the study. Now if we add that time to the time to event while performing analysis, we might be adding a misclassification bias to our analysis. You never know, perhaps something bad happened to the person as soon as the treatment was given, but since we are measuring the time since uh, the person was enrolled in the study, we might get a better overall survival as compared to the patients who weren't given that treatment. So we need to be careful about how the data was collected, how those observations were recorded, and if there are any such uh, issues in the data. Next, please. Another way might be to just record the time from the day the treatment began instead of the date of diagnosis. Now, if we measure the time uh, by excluding the time during which the patient was not being administered that particular drug or treatment that might lead to something known as selection bias because ultimately yes we know that the overall the overall the patient did survive that time so there are a lot of there are a number of studies that tell us how to um, uh, how to take care of uh, such problems. But the only thing that I try, I'm trying to make over here is that it's always nice to look at how your data was collected and what sorts of biases might have been introduced during the data collection and recording processes. One last thing that I'd like to uh, add here is we typically use uh, Cox proportional hazard model or whatever model you're using. Just look at the assumptions they are making before fitting a model. And for Cox proportional hazards model, there is an assumption known as the proportional hazards assumption. So do not fit a proportional hazards model until you have that assumption being fulfilled or you have made adjustments that uh, that can help in that assumption to be true. So that was it from my side. Uh, over to Adam for the next section now. Great, thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll go through this very quickly. Um, but I just wanted to talk about really a power analysis and how we determine how many samples to actually recruit into our study. So as a bit of motivation, let's imagine we've got a distribution again like this in the top right corner with this blue distribution. And let's imagine we sample three subjects in two different groups. One might be a control arm, one might be an intervention arm. Let's say the green's a control and the red's an intervention. There is a chance that when we, when we do the sampling that we get three subjects like this, three subjects like this. And when we look at this graph in the middle, we see that if you just look at mean survival time, you'd think the mean survival time of uh, the intervention group is much longer than the mean survival time of the control group. So if you did an inferential test, let's say you did a t-test between these, um, you might get a p-value of 0 0.07, which is a shame and you might think it's not significant. So it might be tempting to actually add a few more subjects to the analysis. Um, next slide, please. And it, it might be tempting to say, oh, let's recruit an extra two subjects and that might tip my p-value over to a 0 0.05. So now, given that I had these three subjects, I randomly sampled two more subjects from this di distribution. And as you see, when I, got, when I did this randomly, I got two subjects in the control group, pretty close to the mean, and the same for the red group as well. And when I did a t-test now with these two samples, I actually got a p-value of 0 0.04. You might think, great, it's significant, it's more likely published, it shows that the intervention works. But in actual fact, what you've done is you've p-hacked. So you can't really do this in, in, in reality. And the reason for this is that the original assumption that you made when you did the first t-test and you got a p-value of 0 0.07 was that roughly 5% of results would be false positives. And this assumption no longer holds when you um, when you select more subjects and redo the t-test. 
um, you compare two p-values and not one. And so you bias your assessment by taking a close p-value and as a result, have a much higher chance of getting just of getting a few more subjects that will be extreme and therefore tick your p-value over to 0 0.05. So what you, what should you do in this scenario? So in this scenario, when you've got three subjects, you should use your initial analysis where you've got a p-value of 0 0.07 as a preliminary analysis, and you can use it to calculate the power. Um, sorry, you can use it to do a power analysis. And then you can redo the experiment using the actual amount of subjects that you should have used in the first place. And you get this amount of subjects from a power analysis. Next slide, please. So if, you do, if you've done a power analysis in advance, then this determines what sample size will ensure a high probability that we correctly reject the null hypothesis, that there is no difference between the two groups. And if we use the sample size generated from the power analysis, we know that regardless of the p-value we achieve, we attain, sorry, then we use the correct amount of data to make a good decision. So it doesn't matter if we've got a p-value of zero or less than 0 0.05 or not, we know that we use the right sample size to, to get a trustworthy p-value. Um, next slide, please. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here about this, uh, but here's a, a flowchart of, of how to go about doing a power analysis. And a power analysis relies on having previously estimated effect sizes. So in a survival analysis, this is generally a hazard ratio. Um, it also relies on having, a, having um, alpha and beta values. So that's your, your um, significance level and one minus your power. And these are, are generally pretty predetermined. So normally people use alpha of 0.05 and a power of either 0 0.8 or 0 0.9. And we also need to determine the survival function. So um, it less, you could imagine it's an exponential function. So it's e to the minus lambda t. And now here I've, I've shown the formulas for the Friedman formula. Uh, there are multiple different ways of calculating this, but this is just one example. And you can also use multiple different toolboxes on Python for calculating this as well, which will just do it all for you if you've got these three values over here. Um, so we've got the number of events equal to this particular formula here, and you'll see that it's based on effect size and um, Z statistics. Next slide, please. And these Z statistics, um, they might look daunting, but they're very easy to find out. If you've got your alpha, let's say your alpha was 0 0.05, then Z statistic for 1 minus alpha over 2, so for 0 0.975, you can quite literally look up from this Z table. Um, I don't know if you can, if I, if I can, you can point at 0 0.975 on the table. You know, um, and you can, if you look on the left, you can see that you've got a Z stat of 1.9 and you look up and you've got a, um, a full value of 1.96 for that. Next slide, please. So given that you've got the number of events, we, all, we know that not every subject has an event in a survival analysis. So um, the formula for that, we can then calculate the number of participants based on the number of events. And this, um, in this bottom row, R is the ratio of the number of subjects in your groups. So it's N, M1 over N0, and um, S is your survival function, and MF is your median, uh, median follow-up time. You can then adjust the follow-up using this, blur, this final equation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide again, thank you. So just as a very quick example, going back to Rob's example about convicts, where 432 prisoners were recruited into this city, and um, after they were released, they were, they were followed and some of them were given financial support and some of them weren't. And it was to see how many of them were rearrested or arrested again, sorry. And actually 114 of these were arrested again. And if we pick, if we pick um, the normal values for alpha, which is 0 0.05, we can calculate our Z stat of 1.96. And I've rearranged the formula you saw on the previous slide to find out the Z statistic uh, given this number of events. So we can actually find out what the power of that analysis was. And um, I printed out on the right, just a terminal printout of, um, of the cost proportional hazards model summary for that, uh, particular, uh, that particular study. And we can see that the hazard ratio, which is the expectation of the coefficient for whether a patient, sorry, whether a participant was given financial support or not is 0 0.68. So we can literally substitute these values into the formula and we get a Z statistic equal to 0 0.074. And then if we look this up on the Z, Z lookup tables again, we find a power of 53%. So it's not, actually, it's not a particularly well powered to do this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the interest of time, I probably won't go through this example, but again, it's just a case of, um, if you've got some known values, using the Z lookup tables to find out what the Z stats are and just substitute them into, a, into, a, um, into these two formulas to find out the number of events 
and the number of participants required to have a, a 90 percent power uh, thank you very much and that's the end of my slides thank you uh Vinci, would you like to go next uh, yes you can yes. share your screen okay no. okay let me share my screen yeah, hello, so today I'm gonna show you how to use Python to do this survival analysis. And uh, the link of, and uh, this link of the notebook and has been shared in the chat window. And uh, you can make a copy on your own Google Drive and then play around it. So basically this notebook, it will tell you how to and how to use this company micro to do this estimation of the survival curves and how to visualize this uh, and uh, out and how to visualize this uh, and uh, this hazard curve and uh, how to use this log run test to compare this survival distribution of uh, two different groups and uh, then how to use this cox proportional hazard model to see the relationship between the survival time and uh, one or more variables and we are, and we also show you how to use this regressed coefficients of this fitted cost model as a new feature for this survival analysis. So first we need so first we need to load the data and this survival data it is simulated using the pi survival package and as you see and as you can see from this table, so totally we simulated 1000 subjects and each subject has 10 features and also have this time uh, value and also the event value. And uh, we can call this info method, uh, which can tell you the type of the value in, uh, in each column and also check if there are some known values here. And uh, and if there are some value, and if there are some value which are not numerical values, uh, oh sorry, <laughs> sorry, I think addition decent. Yeah, so you can run this kind of uh, function uh, to convert uh, the values into uh, into these numerical values. But uh, but uh, because in, and uh, because in our data set we do not have this kind of values, so we will so and uh, so I will skip this part. So first, I will show you how to use this complement mayor curve to estimate this survival probability. So we need to call this complement mayor filter function from this life and uh, from this lifeline package, and use this time channel and also this event channel to plot uh, this probability curve. And uh, as you can see, with time goes on, this uh, survival probability should uh, decrease from one to zero. And uh, you can also call this event table method to give a summary about the value in the table. So as you can see, uh, it will show you the number of patients which are observed to death and also the number of patients who are censored and uh, who are uh, and who are at risk at each uh, event happens. And uh, you can also call this uh, survival function uh, method uh, to have one idea about uh, the probability at each time event. And uh, also you can call this confidence interval um, uh, method uh, to say what is this confidence interval at each time event. Okay, and uh, when you want to say on average 50% patients survive, or what will be the time, you can call this method, which is median survival time. And uh, so when we look into this curve, we can say if this survival probability it is, uh, it is 0 0.5, this time should be slightly higher than one. Uh, yeah, which is consistent with value here. Yeah, and uh, we can also uh, plot this uh, cumulative density uh, using the fitted model. So as you can see, we and 
And as you can see, as the number of survival days increase, so, and uh, this uh, probability of, uh, of a person dying should increase. OK, next I will show you how to use this Nielsen Allen curve to visualize this uh, and uh, this uh, cumulative hazard. So here we need to call this a function from this lifeline package and use this time column and also the and also this event column. Uh, and then and uh, then when we fit this model on these two columns, we can get this uh, curve here. So as you can see, when the time goes on, this uh, and uh, this color, the cumulative hazard should increase. And uh, when we want to say at when uh, when we want to say at one uh, at one specific time point, what will be this cumulative hazard? We can call this predict method. Okay, next I will sh and uh, next uh, this notebook is show you how to use this log rank test to compare this survival distribution of two groups. Uh, yeah, uh, so here. So here you can use describe method on this data set, which can give you these statistics of the value of each uh, column. So you can so uh, so uh, so and uh, you can get the value of the mean value, standard deviation, mean and also max value of each column. And uh, you can also call this method, which is hist, which can give you this histogram of this history uh, and uh, of this distribution. Uh, sorry, and uh, this part should be six. OK, OK, so uh, uh, OK, so what we do here is that uh, to check if there is and uh, check if there is any and uh, to check if there is any significant difference in this survival rate when we only consider one feature. So here we take this feature as one uh, as like a case and uh, take the mean value of this X6 feature as the cutoff value here. And then we divide the whole data set uh, into two parts, into high risk and uh, low risk based on this X6 value here. Yeah, and next uh, we plot this kaplan meyer feature on each groups. And uh, you can see the curve here. Uh, which and which represent the survival probability on these two different groups, and uh, the value here it gives you the number of people at risk, and uh, also censored, uh, and also event to death at each time point. So and uh, so you can use this log rank test uh, function from this lifeline package to calculate its p-value uh, based on this patient stratification. So here we get p-value, which is very small, uh, which means this feature, it can significantly differentiate these two groups. And we can also plot this, and we can also plot this, and uh, this cumulative density for these two groups and uh, get this figure here. OK, next I will show you how to use this Cox proportion and uh, how to use this Cox proportional hazard model to do the univariate and also multivariate uh, Cox, um, Cox regression analysis. Uh, so first of all, this new and first of all, this univariate Cox regression analysis, we take the feature X6. Uh, and fit this Cox pH filter function on this data set, which only have one feature and also the time and the event column. So after fitting, we can get this kind of table. So, so from this table, you can see the value of this regress coefficient and also this hazard ratio, which is 1.08, which means increase and uh, and uh, which means unit increase of this X6 feature should lead to 8% increase of risk. And uh, you can also get this confidence interval of this hard ratio here and get this p-value here, 
we say the p value it is and uh, the p value here it is smaller than 0 0.005 which means it is statistically significant and uh, from this table you can also get this c index value which is 0 0.59 and also there is another way to calculate this uh, concordance index uh, where you can call this concordance index function and uh, use the feature column and also the time and event column. So you can see we get the same C index here comparing with this one. Okay, next uh, we consider a multi-variate uh, Cox regression uh, 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 analysis. So here we use all the 10 features and want to say uh, the performance if we combine all the and uh, uh, so we want to say the contribution on this survival probability if we use all the 10 features. So we fit this Cox pH filter function on this data set and uh, get this table here. So from this table, you can get this hazard ratio for each uh, feature and also get and also get the p-value here, which are showing that all of the features, they are significant here. And uh, we get C index uh, 0 0.88. And uh, still you can use this concordance index function to calculate this C index here. So from this table, as you can see, this X8 uh, feature, it has the highest hazard ratio, which is 2.12, uh, which means you need to increase of X8 should lead to 112% higher risk of death. Yeah, uh, so when you call this method plot, uh, you can get this uh, forest plot here so 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 uh, so we can say that this x8 feature it has the highest uh, coefficient um, com and com and when you compare it with other co uh, and with other features which shown is uh, we and we show that it has higher influence on the survival probability and, and here we want to say uh, what if we all and uh, what we and uh, what if we keep all the other feature constant and only change one feature, uh, one covariate. So here we keep all the feature constant and uh, just increase x8 value. So you can and then plot this survival probability curve. So as you can see, this is the curve when x8 it is zero. And uh, when we increase this x8 uh, value, this curve will become steeper and steeper, uh, which is consistent with what we observed before. And here, and next, uh, we try to to try to uh, and uh, try to observe some subjects and see the influence of, uh, of features on these survival curves. So here we only consider the first five subjects uh, and plot this survival probability of each subject. So as you can see this subject two, which is in the green color, and it has the high and it has higher survival uh, rate comparing with other patients. And when we look into this table, we can see that this subject two, it has the lowest x6, uh, uh, eight, um, and uh, which may tell us the reason why it has a uh, slower uh, decreasing rate here. Okay, and, uh, and uh, finally we want to use this partial hazard feature, which can also be called risk score from this Cox model, which is fitted on this discovery uh, set and uh, test on the on this validation set. So first uh, we try to divide this whole data set into discovery and validation. And then we fit this Cox pH model on this discovery cohort. And after we get and after we get this fitted model, so we run it 
on this discovery cohort and also on this validation cohort to to uh, to get this risk score. And then we take the mean value of this risk score in this discovery cohort as the cutoff value and divide the patient into two groups. And the same and the same as what we said before that we plot this complement mile curve for each group and calculate this log rate test. So here we get p value, uh, which is uh, very, very small. It is much smaller than 0 0.005. And uh, when we use the same cutoff value on this uh, validation cohort and uh, do the same work, so we get the p value on this validation set is also very, very small. It is much smaller than 0 0.005. And we can also calculate this uh, concordance index on this validation set. So here we get 0 0.88. So which means this harder the feature and this risk score uh, and uh, this feature it is shown significant in both discovery and also validation cohorts where it gets p value which is much smaller than 0 0.005 and gets c index around 0 0.88. Yeah, and uh, beside uh, this p uh, p value and also so and also c index, there are also some other and uh, and there are some other evaluation matrix. And uh, please go and uh, please refer to the following links, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you, Vinci, and thank you everyone for staying over time. Uh, uh, I think we should have probably reduced the number of slides, but I hope this has been helpful. If there are any questions, uh, can ask. Uh, Adam, do you want to say anything about the quiz? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, sorry that we ran out of time a little bit. So if anyone wants to do the quiz still, I've attached a link onto the chat and feel, it'll tell you the answers if you get it wrong anyway. But feel free to um, email me or message James if you've got any questions. Thank you, Adam, for, for arranging that quiz and thank you, everyone. Uh